Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. Federal health officials say that flu activity is low right now, but they expect that to pick up in the weeks ahead. But doctors say the best protection you have against the flu is to get vaccinated. To talk about this year's flu vaccine, we're pleased to have back with us Vince Murphy with the Pharmacy Clinical Services Manager with Walmart Pharmacy. So thanks for coming back. Yeah, thanks for having us back. Pleasure to have you with us. So, um, you know, I think the big question, why do, why do I need to get a flu shot every year? Yeah, I mean, so... So with the flu shots, two things can happen. One, our body's immune system start to wane over time. And so the flu shot that you got last year, uh, your protection starts to decrease over time. The second piece is that the flu, it likes to change from year to year. Uh, some years we can have subtle changes where uh, the immunity that you may have gotten from a flu shot has changed. And some years we have big shifts like in 2009 with the big swine flu or H1N1 outbreak. So it's important each year uh, the CDC picks strains uh, really based off of what we see in the southern hemisphere uh, while they're having their flu season and developing a vaccine that uh, we think are going to be the, the most common strain circulating. And what kind of a season they have is no indication what kind of a season we're going to have either, right? It, it, Correct. As it's it travels kind of our, across the it's world. It's kind of our best evidence to say, you know, we might see those strains in a, in a global world we live in. Uh, those strains could travel and it helps to give a good idea of the vaccines and strains that we're going to be giving, uh, but it can change, again, from different areas of the country, uh, even to different areas of the world. So what do we know about this year's um, um, vaccine and, and what strain it, it, it helps or protects us against? So typically, uh, for the last several years, flu shots have typically contained anywhere from two to three strains. Uh, all flu shots contain two A strains, and A strains are usually the most severe. They're the ones that are going to put you in the hospital and potentially lead to, to death. And so those are the same in every vaccine. And then uh, there are some vaccines that we call a quadrivalent, which has four strains. And so you have the two A's plus two additional B strains. And B strains, usually a little bit milder of a disease, but it can still last a lot longer. And we mm -hmm. usually see B strains show up later in the flu season, whereas A usually typically happens a little bit earlier in the year. Yeah, it seems like, it seems to peak like around the holidays, first of the year, sort of, in at least in this part of the country, is what that we see a lot of, but. Correct, yeah, I mean, the CDC tracks flu vaccines uh, and the flu activity uh, mm -hmm. on the CDC website every year. And so over the last about 30 years, they've tracked, and usually uh, January, February, March are typically your right. top three months for peak flu activity, but we've seen outbreaks as early as now, in November and December even. And it seemed like, the last flu season earlier this year that it did seem to be longer this past season and it was pretty severe as well. We yeah, had a number I mean, of a lot of injuries and some deaths as yeah, well. Yeah, and they, the CDC published their results from last flu season just uh, a few weeks ago and it was 80,000 flu related deaths Incredible. in the US and it's, you know, definitely tragic when we have something like a flu vaccine that can uh, either prevent the flu altogether or at least reduce the symptoms so people can get healthy again. So who should be getting their flu shot? If they haven't gotten it, they should get it as soon as possible so they get the greatest protection from it. Correct. So the CDC recommends anyone six months of age and older is recommended to get a, a flu vaccine, um, age appropriate and, and even uh, you know preference specific as well. Uh, so if you're six months of age or older, you need to get to your pharmacy, uh, doctor's office or clinic to, to get your flu shot done. Um, uh, depending on which strains are, are circulating and which flu vaccines, that's a discussion you can have uh, with your healthcare provider to figure out which vaccine is best for you. And it seemed like the CDC was saying that um, it for younger children, the flu vaccine could be life-saving. Definitely. So typically flu impacts the extremes of age. So our, our young babies and, and children and the older adults. And so, um, you know, even younger, healthier adults such as ourselves, we still need to get that protection. It's, you know, I, I like to tell my patients at the store, if I could give you a 50% off uh, <laughs> at the Walmart pharmacy, would you take it? It's the same thing goes if I could give you a flu shot and if it's 50% effective, that's a 50% reduction, which can be pretty significant. So uh, it's definitely still a good idea to get the flu shot. Um, the CDC recommends to get your flu shot by the end of October. Obviously, we're a little bit past that now, Absolutely, yeah. uh, but it's still not too late. 
Uh, it's never too late. Exactly. So always go in. If you haven't had that flu shot or you have difficulty getting into the clinic, uh, pharmacies, other minute clinics, uh, urgency room, are uh, great areas that you can go ahead and get your flu shot as well. And um, and it takes a little bit, too, to get that immunity as well. I mean, is it two weeks or so before once you've gotten your flu shot to be fully immune? Yeah, exactly. It takes about two weeks for a flu vaccine to become effective. So if you get it today here in early November, it's going to become effective. That's the time it takes for our body to ramp up, create the antibodies, provide that protection. And so again, the sooner we can get that flu vaccine in, the better. Seems like I've been seeing a lot of ads uh, saying that um, people over 65 should get uh, a specific type of a flu vaccine. And why is that? And yeah. what is it? So we discussed some various options. Uh, there's multiple different formulations, uh, the, the quadrivalent, the so trivalent. So that is what that one is, okay. Um, what the, what the uh, senior dose is, or the, there's two actual formulations for adults that are designed for adults over 65. Uh, adults over 65, generally that immune response isn't as robust oh, as a younger sense. adult. Yeah. Um, so there's two vaccines. One is an adjuvant vaccine, which actually um, is a flu particle connected to kind of a super particle that really revs up the immune system. Our other one um, is the high dose and actually has four times the amount of flu particles in one flu shot. And by that kind of uh, overload of vaccine particles, it helps to stimulate a stronger immune response. And so generally speaking, um, we have some evidence to say that those senior doses do provide a little bit better of a response. And while they only have three strains, uh, they'll give you better protection against those most severe a strains. And why is it that children need two doses of it, of a flu vaccine? So generally, uh, in the first flu season for, for a child uh, between six months and eight years, um, if they've never received a vaccine, so they're vaccine naive, uh, the CDC recommends actually two doses. The first dose is a primer dose. Uh, since the body's never been exposed to influenza, our body needs that wake up and to basically get the child's immune system familiar with what the flu looks like. Then it's recommended to get a second dose at least 28 days later, and that's what's really going to be providing that protection from the flu. Now the child's immune system is ready to go. It's been primed. It knows how to create the proper antibodies to fight off the flu if, it were to, if the child were to come into contact with the flu. And I understand the nasal spray is now an option again. Correct. And who so, is it an option for and who is it not for? So is after about a two-year hiatus of not having the nasal vaccine, we, the FDA and CDC have re-recommended the nasal mist uh, to patients aged 20, uh, 2 to 49 years of age. Okay. Um, there are some precautions. Patients who have a decreased immune system are either taking medications or are living with a condition that can decrease the immune system. Since the nasal vaccine is what we call a live attenuated. And the others are not. Correct. All right. the other vaccines are, are inactivated. Uh, there's that potential. So we would recommend an inactivated vaccine for those patients. Uh, also patients with breathing difficulties, COPD, asthma. Um, again, because it's a live attenuated, there's that theoretical risk there that we wouldn't want to run the risk. So a, a, an inactivated flu vaccine would be recommended for those patients. And it is a myth that you, you cannot get the flu from the flu vaccine, right? Correct. So uh, what a lot of patients experience after you get a flu shot is that immune response. We talked about that two week window that, you know, your body will start to rev up. It, it feels like it has the flu. So oftentimes after you get a flu vaccine, you'll get a low grade fever, you have some general body aches, weakness, just kind of a, a blah feeling, so to speak, for a couple days. And that's mm -hmm. perfectly normal. Um, the, the flu vaccines cannot cause the flu. Um, it's, it's impossible. And so, but you will get that immune response. So you can sometimes almost, you know, expect to see that. I tell that to all my patients, you might not feel great tomorrow. Uh, but that's your body going to work, creating those antibodies to prevent you from getting the real flu. Final comments or advice for our viewers on getting their flu vaccine this year? Yeah, so like we said, it's still not too late to get your flu vaccine. Um, clinics, pharmacies, urgent cares are, are great places and locations. You know, pharmacies, you're gonna, we're starting to get into the holiday season. So if you're, you're in the store doing some shopping, it's a great opportunity to stop by our pharmacy. Um, we can also screen you for other vaccines, uh, including pneumonia, tetanus. Uh, we, I think last July we talked about the new shingles vaccine. And so great opportunities to get protected. Um, at Walmart pharmacies, we're able to immunize uh, adults 19 years of age and older, uh, but mm -hmm. we can definitely screen those younger children and adults uh, to be able to get in um, and kind of direct them to a place where they can get that vaccine. 
Well, great, advi great advice, so thank you. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate you coming by, and I know you're busy, so thank you so much. Wonderful. Still ahead, uh, we talk with a local doctor about seasonal allergies and asthma. Stay with us. Did you go tanning? You're getting so tan. We need some sun. Protect yourself. Protect your friends. Stop tanning. Learn more at spotskincancer.org. If you've been sneezing and coughing lately, it could be more than the common cold. It could be seasonal allergies and asthma. We're at the Urgency Room in Venice Heights with Dr. Carolyn McLean. Glad to have you with us, medical director here. Yeah, thank you. So um, how can you tell, I mean, coughing and sneezing, sounds like it could be the cold. How do you know the difference between that and seasonal allergies? What are the symptoms? So allergies in general, you don't feel sick. Um, initially, when they come on, you're not sick you're not incredibly run down like you can be when you have an infection. And they do not come with a fever. Oh. So oftentimes, sneezing in and of itself is a, a good marker for allergies because the common cold shouldn't make you sneeze a lot. Um, you oftentimes have watery eyes, you'll have a stuffy nose, you have a little bit of a cough, some itching, some post-nasal drip. And most people who have seasonal allergies, this is not their first season with these allergies. So they think, that's what I have. But you can't develop them at any time. Is that right? Which is unfortunate. At any yeah. time in your life. And any time in your you've life. You've never had them before, and all of a sudden, you, <clears throat> you can get those. them. Yeah, so, so that's an important point because if you're under two, you tend not to have allergies, Absolutely. seasonal allergies, because you haven't been through enough seasons to get them. So you usually have to be over two. So if a child is under two and you're concerned that they might have allergies, you should definitely bring them into the urgency room to have that checked because it could be an infection and not allergies. And do children exhibit different symptoms or some special symptoms? They exhibit very similar symptoms. But the problem is in your first year of life, second year of life, you tend to get 10 viruses a year. So it's hard to tell the difference because you are, children are sick so frequently because it's the normal course of life. You just get your viruses, especially if you're in daycare. Mm -hmm. And at some point before you're 10, you're gonna have most of these viruses and you will develop immunity, but it takes a while. So these kids, it's hard to know if it's something as simple as a Claritin that will help them. And that's when you want them to be evaluated so that you can get your kid back to plane. What's the major cause of these seasonal allergies and asthma at this time of the year, especially in the fall? So it's, it's mold and dust and, and the, it's not like the spring where there's the pollen, but it's more just mold, dust, the leaves are falling, there's a lot of debris. So that's the main thing. And what happens, I mean, what causes these symptoms when you develop these allergies and the asthma? So allergies are really unique to the first world in general because our immune systems are not being constantly bombarded by infectious agents. So our immune systems are so robust and they're always trying to do something. They get bored. So when they don't have a lot of work to do, they will start attacking things that are not necessarily dangerous. So in this country, there's a ton of allergies. And it's very interesting when you look at a country like, the, like America, where we have tons of peanut allergies, and you go to Norway, where they have tons of fish allergy. And it's just because of exposure. So your allergies, when they, if you develop allergies to Minnesota, to things in Minnesota, you could move to Arizona to avoid those allergies and develop allergies to things in Arizona. So is there something you can be doing to prevent developing these allergies? So mm, we, I got a feeling no. Yeah, we, there, there has been some studies and this is somewhat, it, it warms my heart because they say the less you clean, the <laughs> less allergies you're gonna have. And that's always nice to hear. But um, it's, it's really being outside in nature, around animals, around uh, nature. So in places, in cities, there's more allergies than there are in rural areas. Interesting. So when should you seek um, 
emergency care or medical care um, to begin with. You mentioned briefly if it's a child under two, mm -hmm. but how about other times? When should you seek emergency care? So most people with allergies, they're pretty mild and they're mostly irritating. But once your allergies get severe, meaning you can't even get through the day with these allergies and you've tried Claritin and you've tried Flonase, the problem is you're not getting a really good night's sleep because of all this congestion. And that leads to a whole bunch of healthcare problems. So it can lead to obesity, but it can also lead to infection. And when you have all this inflammation in your sinuses, you can develop a sinus infection really easily because it's like a swamp in your sinus, in your sinuses. So, so people will go, gosh, it feels like allergies, but now it's worse. So it's this, you've had this same irritation for a while, but then it suddenly develops into a fever. I actually feel sick. And it's very common for allergies to lead to an infection. And any time you're having a really difficult time breathing. Which would be more maybe the asthma. The asthma, yeah. And so all these allergies can lead to an asthma exacerbation. And sometimes it's hard to tell with kids, but you'll notice that they're not as playful. They're not running around as much. And they seem to get short of breath when they run around. That's when mm -hmm. you want to be seen. And it's very serious, or it can be very serious. It can be, yeah. So Absolutely. don't ignore it. So um, why should someone bring so someone, their child or mm -hmm. a loved one, to the urgency room if they think that they have allergies and that? What can you offer here? So if, I mean, a lot of times it's advice because it's really hard. There's a lot of tools that we have to manage allergies. And it's confusing. When you go to the store, there's 10 different options. So. Yeah. So if you, I mean, there's, there's things as simple as nasal saline washes where you squirt salt water up your nose. That works wonderfully, but you have to do it like 10 times an hour, which no doesn't, doesn't work <laughs> super well in a meeting, no. right? So, so those are things that you can do, but to know what all the tools are that you have to fight these. Mm -hmm. And the really important thing with allergies is that people often don't do is that you should treat them aggressively so they don't develop into an infection. Because a lot of times you're like, it's not that bad. But with all that swelling in your sinuses, it can lead to a sinus infection, it can lead to pneumonia. So you, and, and also, a lot of these medicines have side effects and you can't add, for instance, Sudafed, which is a wonderful allergy medicine, but you can't take Sudafed with a lot of the medicines you're taking, you know, yeah, that people yeah. are taking. So it's important to make sure that you're on the right regimen to treat your allergies that is safe for you. And you have three locations around the Twin Cities? We do. We have one in Venice Heights, one in Egan, and one in Woodbury. Well, Dr. McLean, thank you for being with us. It's always a pleasure. You always have great information. Thanks. We'll be right back with more right after this. Chris Domine is a husband, father, and athlete because a kidney transplant gave him a second chance at life, made possible by an organ donor. Imagine what you could make possible. Learn more and sign up as a donor. Go to organdonor.gov. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. We're pleased to have back with us Cheryl Jogger. She's with the So Wash Co Cares to talk about how you can help families in need this winter. So glad to have you back with us, Cheryl. Thanks for having me, Jody. So you have a fundraiser coming up. Why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, so you know, um, we have one in five kids in South Washington County who are at risk of missing a meal. And that number is a lot higher than I think most people would expect. It's, it's alarming to think that many kids are in you know, wouldn't get their, their meals if it, they didn't go to school That's sometimes. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. And so um, a lot of students rely on the schools for their best meals. And so when school is out, um, some of these families really struggle to put food on the table. And so we, um, as a school district, recently partnered with Second Harvest Heartland on the No Kid Hungry initiative. Mm -hmm. This is a national campaign. You may have seen ads for it around um, TV and mm -hmm. um, it's really a collective impact mission. So we really want to bring everybody to the table. Um, our schools, our elected officials, um, businesses, community members, faith organizations. We want everybody at the table for this work to make sure that every child has enough to eat. Um, and we 
truly believe that if we all work together, we can end child hunger in our community. And that's really what this event is about. Um, it's our third annual Sawashko Cares Winter Pack event. It's on November 14th from 6 to 8 p.m. at our new Oltman Middle School. Um, it's an opportunity for the community to come together, pack meals for our kids in need to take home over the winter break. Um, there's also a volunteer fair that happens at the same time where we've invited community organizations to come in, um, the Food Shelves, Christian Cupboard, Friends in Need, um, several other organizations nice. will be there with tables to present the community with opportunities to volunteer and give back locally. If someone hasn't been involved with it in the past, what's going to be taking place on the 14th besides, you know, the, the, the different vendors there, but what's involved with packing? Are you packing a big lunch or many lunches or? Yeah, so you know this um, event and Sawashko Cares in general was really inspired by the Feed My Starving Children mm -hmm. event. And um, it's, a, it's similar to that, but on a much smaller scale. So we want to make this a really family friendly um, activity. People can come and you know it starts at six, but you don't have to come right at six. It's sort of a come and go event. Um, we'll have games and activities. Um, we have, um, the food packing station where um, you'll you can get a box you have to assemble the box first it's like a printer sized box and then you go with your family to each of the stations and you have a checklist and you put the number of items um, into the box and then um, we have another crew our pallet crew will take the box and load it up onto pallets and then we we store those until we deliver them later in December so this will be when school breaks between the holidays and the first of the year then and stuff yes. like that. And how many meals will it provide for a, a, a child or a family? So the winter pack is really an extension of our weekend pack program. We have a backpack program where kids take home meals over the weekend. And so this is um, similar. We try to um, give uh, enough for one breakfast a day, one snack, one lunch, and one dinner. and. This really is meant to be supplemental. We always want to encourage families who need help to um, visit the food shelves and apply for um, SNAP benefits. Those are more sustainable ways to get mm -hmm. help, but we do want to help bridge the gap and um, let families know what more long-term resources are. And I understand um, there was some re research done recently in Washington County talking about um, the, the stigma of for families, for kids to seek help. You said they should go to the food shelf, but some are reluctant to do that. That's and right. these are our neighbors. I mean, they're our friends. I mean, we may be surprised who is in need of this food. Yes, a lot of um, our No Kid Hungry work is focused on reducing that stigma. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's poverty is not what people necessarily think mm -hmm. of. It's, you know, your people are one um, job loss, one um, medical diagnosis when divorce away from um, being in need and we want to take away the shame of asking for help. This is really our community coming together to help our community. And even if you don't live in the, the district, 833 in South Washington County, anyone is welcome to participate and get involved with this? Absolutely, absolutely. This is a community-wide effort. And then you're also um, doing a clothing donation effort as well going on right now? Why yes. Tell us about that. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. We have received a lot of requests for winter clothing this year. So we're trying to provide um, coats, snow pants, boots, and waterproof gloves for- So essentials. Yes, yeah, the exactly. The frilly things. And, and uh, yes, and so if, um, we have on our Sawashko Cares Facebook page, we have a, a Google Doc, which has the full list of requested items and people can go in and type in their name next to anything they might be able to donate and it has the school um, where those items can be delivered right on that list. And so it, the, the response so far has been incredible. Our the need response? Yes. The, both. And, oh, both. Okay. Yes. The um, people volunteering to donate items, um, that our PTOs have really stepped up and community members in general. It's been beautiful to see. And how many kids are you hoping to help with clothes and stuff for the winter here? So we have about, I think on the list there's probably close to um, between two or three hundred. Oh my gosh. And so when you count all those items, you know, it's, we're, we're nearing a thousand items that we're, we're looking for. And we're, we've got a good dent in it, but we can use more help. So yeah, if people could please visit the Sawashko Cares page and, and 
take a look at the list. And that's what I was going to say. If, if they're interested in participating in the November 14th thing, but or they're not able to be there, how can they contribute? Yep, so um, if you're not able to attend, we're, we're also accepting donations. We're collecting um, mac and cheese cups, Nutri-Grain bars, and rice sides. Um, you can also make a monetary donation to Sawashko Cares. And um, yeah, and also visit, we have a, so the nokidhungry833.org website has a list of ways to, to help. And before we part, I should introduce your guest here, yes, your I, sidekick. I brought my little <laughs> helper with me. This is Dahlia. She's a second grader, and the kids were trying to help our kids that my kids go to school with. So it's really yeah. making an impact locally. That's really wonderful. Well, Cheryl, always wonderful to have you with us, and I really appreciate everything that you do for all these kids. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Finally, health care remains one of the top issues of concern, and because women make most of the health care decisions for themselves and their families, it's not surprising that in the 2018 midterm election that record numbers of women are running for public office and record numbers of women are getting out and voting. The League of Women Voters in Minnesota has been encouraging women to exercise their right to vote for more than uh, almost 100 years. And in fact, next year, the Minnesota League will be celebrating its centennial anniversary. The state executive director, Michelle Witte, tells us what to expect. Please join us for the League of Women Voters Minnesota five-part centennial series to help commemorate and celebrate our 100th anniversary of empowering voters and defending democracy and of the passage of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. In 2019, we will host three signature events. On April 26, we will kick off a traveling history exhibit at Landmark Center in conjunction with our statewide LWV Minnesota Convention in St. Paul. This exhibit will travel in collaboration with local leagues across the state. On September 8th, we will host a community-wide open house at the Minnesota Suffrage Memorial Garden. This event will be free and open to the general public and will commemorate this special day when the Minnesota Legislature voted yes to ratify the 19th Amendment. And on October 26, we will gather for our 100th birthday gala at Union Depot in St. Paul to celebrate the official incorporation of LWV Minnesota on October 29th of 1919. In 2020, we will celebrate August 26th, Women's Equality Day, at the Minnesota State Fair, marking this historic day when the 19th Amendment became the law of the land. And in the fall of 2020, we are excited to announce that the Minnesota History Center will be opening a major exhibit on women's suffrage and voting rights in Minnesota. We're so excited to partner with the Minnesota History Center on this exciting exhibit. Local League toolkits and events will accompany this series to include the traveling historical exhibit and ideas for featured speakers and events, and parade and summer festival ideas for the summer of 2020, which also help to support voter service events during this prime election year. Sign up on our website to be part of this great centennial celebration. Well, that's our program for you. Thanks for joining us. We hope you join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone.